welcome everyone to the Fermentation Association's webinar of launching a fermented brand. I'm Amelia Nielsen Stoll, editor of TFA. We are a trade group that was launched to support producers who use fermentation to create delicious and often healthful food and beverages. Our goals are to help educate consumers about fermentation and its benefits, support scientific research into those health benefits, and work with food safety authorities to establish clearer and more appropriate regulations in regards to fermentation. Today, we bring you two great speakers, Joshua Rood, co-founder and CEO of Dr. Hop's Real Hard Kombucha and author, Alex Lewin. We have many questions already submitted and reviewed with our speakers. If there are additional topics you'd like to see addressed, please enter them in the chat below and we will try to get to them. All right, Alex, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Amelia. Uh, first, in the interests of full disclosure, uh, I am an investor and advisor to Dr. Hops, so I am extremely biased, um, but also um, um, clear-minded, I think, about you know the successes and failures, I think. Uh, anyway, so with that having been said, um, we're here. Well, so I've, I've written a couple of books about fermented foods, real food fermentation, and then uh, kombucha, kefir, and beyond with my co-author Raquel Guajardo. And I'm uh, an advocate of fermented foods and I'm an advisor to the Fermentation Association. Um, and I'm just fascinated by them. And I think the fermented foods may hold the key to our salvation as human beings, both digestive and health salvation, but also spiritual salvation um, without being too uh, uh, exaggerated about it. But this isn't about me. This is about Dr. Hops and Joshua and creating a fermented brand. So Joshua Rood, uh, CEO, co-founder of Dr. Hops, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your pre-Dr. Hop's life and then um, maybe a little bit about uh, how the idea came along and what happened then. Yeah, thank you, Alex. And uh, you know, as always, it's awesome to be with you. Greatly appreciate everything that you've contributed to Dr. Hop's um, since we first started working on it. Uh, I think you were there almost from the very, very beginning, 2015 for us. Um, so for me, uh, I mean, I, you know, I have a very, a varied background. I grew up in Maine and had my hands in the dirt a lot. You know, we had a big garden. I was, that was, you know, as a kid, you grow up, that's your job. You weed the garden, you pick the vegetables, you, you, you know, uh, you eat most of them as you're picking them. Uh, and so that's, that did set the, it sort of set my palate up for real fresh food. There's just uh, nothing, nothing like it. <laughs> you can't fake that. So um, that's always been there for me. And you know, I went, uh, you know, I, I went to, went to college, studied economics, uh, moved to LA, um, you know, tried to make it in the music business, was a bartender. I was a espresso caterer. I did a lot of a lot in liquor and coffee in Los Angeles and a lot of mixology there. And then I um, spent quite a bit of time uh, recovering from Los Angeles in yoga, meditation, got into raw foods, macrobiotics, living foods, worked a lot at, at yoga retreat centers, uh, cooking and serving food. And that's um, you know, that's when I started to get really interested in, in uh, fermentation and, 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 living, and living fresh foods of all, of all kinds. And, um, and then I worked uh, with Lululemon Athletica um, uh, in, you know, Lululemon is a community uh, oriented brand. And, and at Lululemon, I really uh, started learning about business. You know, Lululemon gives you the keys to the to their business when you work there. <laughs> they give you all the all the all the tools that they use to build their company, and so I studied all those tools, and uh, and that gave me enough of a business background to feel confident that I could start a company. 
Great. Um, so you're making kombucha at home or you, your you know, co-founder was making kombucha and then somehow you had the idea to make hard kombucha. Um, I guess, tell us a little more of just the, the lead in and then um, I guess you have some slides you wanna share. Any, any context before those slides and then just launch into the slides. So. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I've looked through the, the, the list, uh, the, the folks that are here, a lot of you are clearly interested. You're, you, you're very personally interested in fermented foods. Um, and I'm gonna try to speak to that as much as I can. Um, for, for me and my co-founder, Tommy, you'll, you'll see him uh, on, our, on our slides momentarily. Um, you know, the, the fascination with food and beverage is, is, has, you know, goes all the way back, you know, to, to being kids, to being in that garden. Um, in, you know, in the mid, you know, in 2015, 2014, when this idea started to formulate for me to create a, a high alcohol kombucha product, uh, you know, craft beer was getting very interesting. The quality and the variety available in craft beer was, it was awesome. Uh, kombucha was starting to really develop, non-alcoholic kombucha. It was, it was at that point way beyond GTs. Uh, we were starting to get a lot of local kombucha makers, a lot more variety. So there was a lot of creativity happening in both craft beer and kombucha. I was fascinated by both. Tommy also fascinated by both. You know, I've certainly made some kombucha at home um, previous to that. Um, not a ton. Tommy was, Tommy's my brewer. He's the guy who was experimenting, making beer, making kombucha, growing mushrooms, doing all sorts of things. Um, and uh, it was really critical for me. You know, I was, I was coming at it from a, a, a real desire to, to create a brand and a product that really pushed the envelope in what you can do in a commercial product that's very authentic. You know, GTs really did set the stage for that in the kombucha world, making a profoundly real authentic kombucha and doing it very successfully commercially. So I wanted to do that with an alcoholic product because um, there's so much room for that in alcohol. We just don't have a lot of focus on on health in alcohol, or at least there hasn't been traditionally. So, so um, yeah, for me it was a, it's a, it's and it still is. It's a it's a passion for creating a more delightful, health conscious alcohol, uh, and and really pushing the envelope in that. Great. <laughs> um, show us some slides. Okay, great. So with that, uh, and and a, a little bit more. I know a lot of you have a lot of, you know, have really specific questions and we're gonna try to get to as many of those as we can at the, at the end. First, I wanna give you a, a, a broad, as broad a, a view of what we've gone through since 2015 as I can, um, cause you know, there's a lot of different people on the call and, and you know, I want you to get, get as much from it as, you, as all of you can. So I'm gonna try to, I'm going to share the journey that we've been on through the view of our, like our pitch decks. Like I'm not pitching Dr. Huff's today, uh, but what I have available to me are all the slides that I've used in various pitch decks over the last five years. So I've, I've, I've crafted them a little bit to be, you know, more applicable to this conversation today, but the, you're going to see the, the slide decks, the, the slides from our pitch. And I'm gonna talk about them more from a basic journey, like the journey of our business point of view. And, and the and, pitch for, for folks who don't know that that term of pitch is like if you were trying to get an investor or something like that. Yeah, and it's, it's perfect because while all of us love, oh, most of us have a direct personal like love for and passion for fermented foods, creating a business out of it, it mostly keeps coming back to raising money. <laughs> so, so that's what I have, right? So here we go. Um, it'll all make sense to you in a second, but keep that in mind um, as we go. All right, Alex, can you see the slide? Yep. Okay, great. 
so 2015 is when I, right, it was right after I met my co-founder, Tommy, and right, that's when we really started to, started from scratch, started from our passion, and, uh, you know, we recognized that we could work together really well, and I had Tommy make a prototype, and we just started, just, just started, one foot after the other, right, and um, in the beginning, you know, we, we were making Dr. Hobbs in my kitchen, and we were the first people in the Bay Area to do it. At this, at this point in time, there really wasn't a hard kombucha category in, in beverage. There, were, there was you know, one kombucha beer company from Michigan. They were a big part of my inspiration. And then you know, right when we started, you know, Boochcraft in San Diego, California started. Um, and you know, we, uh, essentially, the, the first thing we needed to figure out was how to communicate to investors and people like what we were trying to do and why we were trying to do it. And this is like an early version of, of how we did that. We, you know, our fundamental business proposition is clear. People want to drink alcohol and they want to be healthy and we want to make that more possible. So, um, you know, we, we kind of looked at all of the other options available in alcohol and what was, you know, what was not working for a lot of us about them and how we could address those, those concerns with our, with our product. And, you know, just a little overview of how we started. It took us, uh, you know, we started from scratch. So it took us a, a few years to just figure out the basic stuff, the licensing and how to make the product and, you know, how to label, how to create legal labels and get and deal with all of the alcohol licensing issues and also learn how to make the product relatively stable even though it's a true living fermented product and it and it will still ferment in, in in its packaging so you know i i started with the business model canvas if you're if you know for anyone starting a business it's an awesome place to start gives you a very broad uh you know, way to look at your business categorized into different chunks. Um, we started, Tommy and I didn't have a, a war chest of our own. So we started with a Kickstarter, you know, made a video, made a prototype. Um, you know, I used 99 designs to find a designer to create the first version of our brand. Um, um, we did, you know, another uh, crowd, you know, crowdfunding campaign the following year. Um, and we started to get more of our audience involved. Like we, you know, we, we've from the very beginning gotten a lot of feedback from the people who want this product about what we were doing. What, what do they like? What don't they like? A ton and a ton of direct communication with our consumers. And then, um, you know, that wasn't giving us any significant amount of money to, to, to go with. So in, you know, in 2017, we really started to raise, uh, money, you know, like a more sophisticated startup. We started issuing convertible notes and doing friends and family and building our network. Uh, and that allowed us to actually start commercial production in 2017. It's still extremely small scale, but it was at that point we had our licensing figured out. We had the basics in place. So that's, it took two years really to even get up and running at all for us. And then, um, you know, this, we had, an, we had a pretty clear sense of what we wanted from our product early on. You know, I had had Tommy make a prototype right at the very beginning, and we knew what it was. It needed to be probiotic, actually alive with viable cultures, it needed to be a gluten-free product. We were clear we wanted to make it a kombucha-based product. I was clear it needed to be gluten-free, you know, for the commercial viability of that and the importance of that. And we wanted it to have a certain alcohol content that was fairly aggressive um, because we thought we could do that especially well. That's, uh, that was important to us. So, um, and we also had this, uh, like I had this really strong sense of the brand, like the very basics of the brand. Like first we had this amazing rabbit. Her name was Dr. Hops. Tommy and I loved hops. We wanted to put hops in our kombucha um, and the, the, you know, the rabbit Dr. Hops was uh, away from my wife, Lisa. My wife, Lisa, is this 
this the most amazing person in my life. And, and she loved this rabbit so much um, that it was a, a great opportunity for me and Tommy to honor that, to honor her love for this creature, our love for you know, living organisms in general. Uh, and of course, her name was perfect. So we decided to run with that and call ourselves Dr. Hops. And um, let's see, you know, the next big thing we had to figure out was how, you know, once we basically knew how to make our product, how do we get it to market? There's no bigger problem really in, uh, in a, you know, in a food or beverage product, certainly, then how are you going to get this to the market? A lot of you ask questions about that. It's been one of our biggest challenges. It's we've made some real mistakes, uh, and or things are just hard. You know, things are it's challenging. So in the beginning, uh, we we had we we the first people we attracted to our company were not alcohol people. They were like natural foods people. You know, Alex. Uh, I mean, Alex enjoys alcohol, but he's also focused on you know, on a lot of non-alcoholic fermented foods and a lot of, a lot of other food. And, and we got interest from, uh, you know, from the, the, co the co-founder CEO of Numi Tea, you know, one of the most successful all organic tea companies. So we were um, first introduced to UNFI and uh, the more the natural foods distribution channel. And UNFI it was very interesting in California because they actually have their alcohol license in California because of GTs, because of GTs black label, you know, full full strength kombucha. Um, so, and they don't really have any other alcohol brands except for you know GTs original. And um, but we we had good connections to UNFI, and so our our first choice was well let's do that. We. We are, we are as much natural foods people as we are alcohol people. And we know the alcohol business can, can be pretty shady and we would rather not do that. So let's go UNFI, right? Let's go natural foods. And that was um, something that we, we did right at the beginning. It got us some access to Whole Foods, which was our first priority as a retail opportunity. Um, it turned out to be way, way, way harder than we thought. And it didn't work as well as we thought. Uh, mostly we learned that we, even though we, we are natural foods people, we, our product is alcohol <laughs> and, and UNFI doesn't really do that. And th this is obvious to everyone now, but, um, you know, at the time we thought we could figure it out, not so much. So after a couple of years of trying very hard to make our business work through that distribution model, we really had to switch to beer distributors. Beer distributors are the ones that actually know how to sell alcohol that we are licensed as a beer. Our, our product is considered a beer in California and in the United States, just, just barely. Um, so that was a big part of our journey. And we and if you guys have questions about that, uh, you know, I'm well I'm more than happy to go into it more. But um, yeah, just a huge challenge and uh, Again, it's just uh, fundamental to the business, as you, as I'm sure you know. Now, sorry, do you think that's because hard kombucha is a new category? Um, I mean, it'd be easier to get if it were just beer. Like people already know how how to ramp that up and get it distributed, right? It's like it's sort of terra incognita. Was that that was some of the challenge, right? Yeah, that's great, Alex. That, yeah, it's great because a lot of people here do have questions about that because fermented foods in general are still relatively new in the commercial marketplace. Uh, and that's very relevant. Um, yeah, when, when we started, people, most beer distributors do nothing about it. In fact, they still know nothing about it. Um, um, and yeah, that's a, that is a big challenge is how to, a couple of you have asked questions about that actually, how to communicate what it is that you have. What is a fermented food? Why would, 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 should people care about it? For us, what is a kombucha? It, we haven't spent a lot of time 
explaining that because the non-alcohol kombuchas are spending a lot of effort explaining that, which we are leaning on. We, you know, we need that. Um, uh, and, and it's still, it is, it is still a big part of the challenge, Alex, to get from, you know, from the beginning of starting a company to really successful wide scale distribution is, is in our category and in most fermented food categories, a big learning, a big learning curve for the distribution channel, for the distributors and the retailers and the consumers all the way through. Um, so that's certainly been at play the whole time and still is, and I, you know, it's not resolved, but the, for us, for all of us, I think on this call, it, it really does come down to how, how much is the whole community speaking about and educating the world about and celebrating the value of live fermented foods. And the more we're all doing that, the more it works <laughs> to sell these products. So anyone who wants to write about it, talk about it, educate about it, that all matters. That all matters. Um, so uh, just a little bit of how we kind of went. So 2015, you know, we started, this was our very first, um, interaction with people about our product. And Alex was there. He took this photo actually. Um, and this was our first taste taste test. Like what, what do you guys think of this thing we have, right? And, and we just kept doing that. You know, we, that's how we've built Dr. Hops. We just kept trying to get it in front of as many people as possible. Like 2016, we started doing events, as many events as we could. And we didn't even have a product yet. We were just testing it. And we were pretending like we had a product. <laughs> we, and we, and we, in 2017, again, just, we, you know, we got better and better and better at making it. We had more and more things to ask people about. Uh, we just kept doing as many events as we could. Finally, in 2018, we, we, we entered the market with a product, still in, just, just self-distributed uh, at that time, just local, but we started doing street fairs and beer festivals in our market so that we could promote sales at those retailers and keep learning, keep learning. And we just kept doing that all the way through 2019, of course, until March of 2020, uh, when that stopped completely. But we had uh, already done hundreds of events by then, if you know, hundreds and hundreds of events by then. Um, and you know, right before the pandemic started, we had our first big public uh, pitch opportunity. It was a naturally Bay Area event. It was associated with the Fancy Foods Show in, in San Francisco. And we were one of, I don't know, eight or 10 companies to pitch that day in front of hundreds of people. Um, we didn't win. This awesome company, a dozen cousins, won the pitch, the pitch competition that day. Um, but it did get us out in front of a lot of people and uh, was just really important learning experience for me to, in terms of how I talk about the brand to a wider audience. And, and once we had, you know, the pandemic really forced us to focus inward on how our business works. You know, we couldn't do all the marketing we were planning to do, all the field marketing. It was almost all field marketing we were gonna do in 2020, we couldn't do any. So we focused on building uh, a really experienced advisory team. You know, I, both Tommy and I are new to consumer packaged goods. So we need to lean on our advisors significantly for all of that insider experience uh, regarding fundraising, branding, distribution, all of it. So we built this extraordinary advisory team, um, really just step-by-step. Step. Alex was the first piece and, you know, we just kept following, you know, following the network and meeting in people and building. Um, so that's a really critical part of our company. And then, you know, we, we, we were able to keep growing throughout 2020. Um, luckily, we had added a lot of distribution, new distribution relationships right at the beginning of 2020. And even though we couldn't do a lot of the work with them that we had we had planned to do. You know, we couldn't go visit all the stores as often as we were planning, and we couldn't do that field marketing. We still were able to grow 
um, through a lot of hard work, as much you know, as much creative problem solving as we could as we could come up with to keep you know to keep pitching our product to retailers. Um, and um, you know that was really important. You know, you got to do. Circumstances are always going to change uh, in life and in business, and um, you got to keep moving. So that's what we did in 2020. <laughs> keep moving. Um, a part of that work was to update our brand. We had discovered at this point that the brand we started with was somewhat confusing for people. It was much, yeah, it was, you know, our product still has a lot of little pieces to it that contribute to what it is from how we source materials to how we make it to how we don't filter it to like just a lot of little pieces. And one of our biggest challenges is, is still how to communicate that in a very tiny amount of time to consumers and retailers and distributors. So we spent a lot of time in 2020 updating our brand. We went from being kombucha beer to being real hard kombucha. At this point, hard kombucha had become what what this product is called. When we started, it was called kombucha beer. Now it's called hard kombucha. So we uh, spent a lot of time, significant amount of our, uh, of our cash updating our brand. We looked, um, we got really clear about the business fundamentals of our products, the margins, uh, where, the, where the category was moving in terms of packaging types. We discovered that we really had to stop making these bottles because they were almost impossible to get into stores by the end of 2020. Um, so uh, we, we basically made a huge pivot at the end of 2020. We went into an entirely new pack type, 16 ounce cans. This is where everyone in our category has gone. It's over 50% of the hard kombucha category is in this particular package. Um, we, we found that we could still get these cans. It's very hard to get cans. We figured out how to make our product stable enough so that they would work in the cans. Um, and it, it's a huge part of our business growth. We were able to improve the margins and get a lot more retail opportunities in this new package. And this is where we're right in the middle of launching these. We only have one of the four out right now um, and it's not even really in stores yet. Um, but that's a huge part of where we're going. Um, you know, this is this is essentially what we need to show investors. There's a there's still a lot of challenges for us in raising money and and uh, you know improving to people that we have what it takes to to win in the long term. Uh, the fact that we were able to grow our business almost three times in 2020, even in the pandemic with no marketing, is one of the best things we have to say about what we have. People want this. If you and with our new brand, we're confident. If you put it on the shelves in front of them, they will try it. And when they try it, they're going to discover how good it is. And that's what that's what we have. So um, you're, you're welcome to ask any questions about that. But uh, I think that's it for now on that. Um, the the other piece a lot of you are interested in is one of our other biggest challenges is how do we distinguish ourselves? How do we, and how do we communicate all the little subtle aspects of what we have to people quickly, right? This, this chart kind of compares what we have to the other leaders in our category. There's now four really big leaders. At the time when we produced this chart, uh, these were the three uh, biggest players, especially in California. Uh, Boochcraft and June Shine are both out of Southern California. Flying Embers out of Central California. And so we produced this chart so we could show people, you know, some of the differences as quickly as possible. Um, we discovered that one of the things we do best is we have distinct products th are, are throughout our line that compare, each of them compares to a different uh, alcoholic beverage in a very specific way. We essentially have a wine, we have a beer, we have a cocktail and we have a mimosa. And nobody else really has that kind of targeted uh, product lineup that relates to an al alcohol types that people do understand. So while people might not understand hard kombucha, they, they, they pretty much already have a preference between beer, wine, cocktail and champagne, for example, or, you know, 
spritzer. So uh, we're now working to communicate what we have that way so people can kind of you know, wrap their minds around it faster. And uh, ultimately, you know, kind of where we're at now, and we're far from done, like we're, this is very, you know, six years in, there's nothing settled about what we have. Um, but we're now, what we're saying to investors, again, this is, this is for investors, but what we're saying is this is what we're doing. We're, we're refreshing, we're different, right? We're in a very fast growing category, which is hard kombucha. Part of our difference is that we're 100% unfiltered. Pretty much all the other uh, hard kombuchas are filtering to some extent to make their product you know, more stable, more quickly. Um, uh, we're powerfully targeted towards specific consumers, and we have still a lot of work to do to clarify that. And you know, ultimately, what we're doing is produce, and this is what Tommy and I set out to do from the very beginning, is to produce the, the, the perfect balance between pleasure, like booze, and health conscious, viable, low sugar, like quality fermented product. So that's us, the ultimate health conscious buzz. That's what we're building. That's what we're focused on. That's what we're trying to communicate. And, um, and that's what I had to share in the pitch deck. So, uh, and then, and I hope, I hope that was valuable to you. Now I'm going to go back with Alex and we're going to look at some of your questions specifically and see, you know, see how much we can answer. Thanks. That was great, Joshua. Uh, and we have, we have a ton of questions. Some of them that came in while, um, while you were presenting and maybe we can, um, we can answer some of the some of the quick ones, um, and then I'll get into some of the ones that may may take longer answers. Um, and I'll I may even answer some of these just to make it quick. Is your product cold shipped? Yes, um, and you know the cold chain. That's another piece of the another piece of the complexity of the product. I think right, and um, we can come back to that later if you want to talk more about it. Um, Let's see, do you do the canning and bottling yourselves or do you haul it somewhere else? Uh, do you want to say a couple of words about that and about like which pieces of equipment, you know, anything like that? Yeah, um, yeah, packaging is a huge uh, uh, deal for Cans our Cans versus bottles while you're at it. Yeah, yeah, we started, we started in bottles, uh, mostly because they're a little bit cleaner, like a little bit more pure of a package than cans. Uh, you know, cans do have a, a plastic lining essentially in them, and we wanted to stay as far away from anything plastic as we possibly could. Um, so partly we started with bottles that way. Mostly we started with bottles because we found somebody who could put our product in bottles. <laughs> that was mostly why we started with bottles. And, and we also knew that, um, we also knew a little bit more about how to put a, a living kombucha in, in a bottle. So we started with that. Um, and, but then as the marketplace went, especially in hard kombucha, went away from bottles faster and faster and faster, just like craft beer, uh, we had to start figuring out cans because uh, the, the retail opportunities were getting smaller and smaller for bottles. So. We started to figure that out, and and you know, and be, as the demand got greater it, out in the world for cans, uh, you know, other other third party players started to figure out how to can kombucha. So, it, it you know, we're doing it all. We're we don't we currently don't have our own canning line, so we are using a third party for that. But th there, but this is a third party that's now specializing in putting live product into cans. So, and, and we're trying to get into our own canning line as quickly as possible because it is so challenging to, 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 do, it, to do it well. Um, the more control we have over it, the better. And uh, that's a big part of what we're trying to do in 2021. Um, here's an uh, interesting complex of questions. Aside from other hard kombuchas, who is our competition? Like, are we competing with hard seltzer? Are we competing with light beer? Are we competing with, like, what are the other health conscious alcohols that pe pe things that people perceive as uh, health conscious? Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a perfect question because for all of you on the call that or on the webinar that that are wanting to make some kind of fermented product, which is a lot of you, uh, I think this is the same for you. Um, you know, in in a sense, we're not competing with anyone in the hard kombucha space at this point. Just like uh, like we we are competing against other other types of alcohol. Um, and that's how it's been for us. That's what we wanted to do from the beginning also. Like there aren't a lot of options in alcohol or in the still in mainstream supermarket for, you know, that are, that are living health conscious, authentic, you know, uh, probiotic, if you will, like products. Um, so, so, um, we're definitely competing against hard seltzer because hard seltzer is a, a slightly healthier option just because it's essentially lower calorie um, than a higher calorie beverage if you're avoiding calories or wanting to limit your calories, which a lot of people, of course, are. Um, so we're, we're kind of like the, you know, you, sure, you can strip everything out of your alcohol and you can get a, a hard seltzer, which is essentially, you know, alcohol with as much bad stuff removed as possible. <laughs> but it's not very interesting. It's not very fun. There's no, you know, it's just hard seltzer. So uh, if you want, if you really love alcohol and, or you really love food or beverage in general, you want something more interesting than that. So we're trying to make something health conscious really, really interesting and, and, and actually put beneficial stuff in there like lactobacillus. You know, we're not adding lactobacillus. It's a core part of our kombucha culture. But we're trying to, we are trying to make a kombucha culture that has a lot of, you know, of potent lactobacillus culture in it. It's highly alcohol tolerant, so it can still work up to 10, 11, 12% alcohol. Um, and we are trying to compete against just a, a more traditional beer or wine or, or alcohol product that has no focus on health consciousness or live cultures. And um, in terms of the uh, probiotic profile, like um, Dr. Hops has had it tested that, and confirmed that there are live microbes even in the higher alcohol variants. That's is that correct? Yeah, yeah. A lot of you have questions about, you know, not just how to get a live fermented product into a, into packaging and into distribution, um, but also the laws behind it. The the labeling of it, uh, yeah. So regulation, like that, that's a good uh, lead into like talking, you know, maybe a little bit about regulation and uh, laws and and all that. Yeah. So, I mean, for all of you, I, I want my hope here is that all of you are, you know, we're we're doing something pretty specific. Some of you might be thinking about hard kombucha. Mostly, you're not. Mostly, you're thinking about something else, kimchi or uh, wh whatever it is. Um, I want to make sure all of you know you you just got to move forward and figure it out. <laughs> like there's no there's no way I can give you what you need. You just got to go figure it out. Um, um, the and that's fermentation association, right? Well, use the resources that are available, and they keep and they yeah. I, I mean, for sure, we use the Brewers Association. We use you know uh, KBI Kombucha Brewers International. Like we yeah, we use all the resources, but. You mostly you just got to go and figure it out. And for us, that's what we did. We, we started making it. We started testing it. We couldn't do massive amounts of testing, but we could do enough. We could measure the cultures that are in there. We could, we could start to figure out how to regulate the alcohol content better. Um, we could start to test, well, you know, what happens with, our, with re-fermentation in our packaging if we do this versus this, right? Mostly that's just basic. You make it, you put it in the package, you watch and see what happens. You, you taste it. If it tastes weird, then you send it to the lab to test it. What happened? Can you um, say the name of the labs that Dr. Hops uses for testing, or is that secret? No, no, it's not secret at all. Um, it, uh, these are m almost exclusively beverage oriented, but um, for anyone making a beverage, or any kind of kombucha or beer or hard kombucha or, any, or you know, tapache or anything, um, White Labs in, in, in San Diego is, is, a, is an awesome lab. Uh, there's a Kathinka in Colorado, 
is, is an awesome lab that's spending a lot of effort studying kombucha and developing their kombucha program. And there are others as well. You know, there's plenty of places you can get your, you know, gluten tests, but those are the two best for beer and kombucha, mm -hmm. White Labs and Kathinka. Um, we got a bunch of questions of how do you find advisors and investors? Yeah, um, again, when you actually go into business, that becomes a huge part of what you're actually doing. Um, you know, as much as I'm, I'm in, per and Tommy, my co-founder, we're in business to make this product for people. Like that's what, that's what, we're, that's what we're in business to do. You know, what it really comes down to is, is being commercially viable so that you can get the money you need to do that and, you know, and ultimately have it be successful financially for people as well. So um, for us, we're still early, like even after six years working on it, we're essential, we're not, we're not at the venture capital stage yet. We're trying to get there this year. And we have, we now have venture capital companies very interested in what we've been able to do so far, but we're still too small for us to be interested, interesting to them as an investment again, until maybe later this year. So it's all networking, right? It's Alex. I mean, you've been there the whole time. It's been, it's been your network. And then you introduced us to some of our other advisors. And so, and then it's, then it becomes their network and then they introduce us to people who invest and, it be, and it's their network. And it's just building uh, a community of people who love what we're doing, care about what we're doing, uh, have a, a, a enough uh, you know, money to be able to invest to, to legally and just practically. And, um, and just continuing to nurture that network and continuing to communicate with those people, share with them what our successes, uh, just um, connect with, for me, it's, it does, it does a lot does come down to connecting on a personal level and and then also showing what we have as a business yeah i'll say that in my in my experience um uh, watching businesses grow like choose your investors carefully because yes you need money and it may seem like you should take any money that anyone's willing to offer you but when you have investors uh it's kind of like a relationship and um you don't want a relationship where you want different things, right? And um, a good investor, you know, your interests may be aligned in terms of the success of the company, but a good investor is literally invested in the success of the company. And uh, you want somebody ideally who not only you can work with, but who will maybe follow up with more money or maybe they're excited enough about the product that they'll um, help you by introducing you to their network. Um, Etc. cetera. Um, yeah. I want to bring Amelia back in because uh, she may have some questions. Awesome. Um, Hi. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Wonderful. This has been so interesting to hear um, your story behind Dr. Hops. I think your uh, beginning is very relatable to a lot of people here trying to start a brand. We hear most, you know, people trying to start a brand begin at small events, a farmer's market, Tell me what was the next step? You started, you know, I'm assuming you were brewing out of a, a commercial kitchen or a home kitchen. Where did you, how did you move from cottage industry business to working with a co-packer? Yeah, yeah, that's great, Amelia. I did see a lot of questions about that. Um, uh, we kind of did it uh, two ways at the same time. We we knew that we needed uh, to spend a lot of time and effort developing our product ourselves because we have a really high bar for what it is. And, and it's new, like there's no playbook, there's no formula for it or very little. So we needed uh, enough of a commercial facility to be able to do that in a way that was essentially the same way that it would end up getting produced at a larger scale, right? So we needed a small version, a scaled down version of a brewery essentially. So we, so we had to build a brewery ourselves. It was just a really small brewery. So, but that took a while, you know, just, you know, getting the licensing and dealing with all, you know, health regulations and all of that permitting is, is, is significant, especially if you've never done it before. And, and so while we were doing that, we were also tr looking for co-packers that could do it much at a much larger scale. And 
you know, even when we found somebody willing to do it for us, you know, we're right at the edge. Most breweries don't want anything to do with kombucha. So, you know, it would, most will just say, no, we won't, don't bring that stuff into our brewery. Um, but we've, you know, now it's, now it's changing a little bit, but, um, when we found somebody who could, who was willing to do that, then we started working with them at how to do it with their structures and systems and, you know, and trying to figure that part out at the same time. So, um, and obviously they're both related. What, what we were doing at a small scale was designed to be scalable uh, into their system. And, uh, and, it, and, you know, it worked pretty well. It, we certainly made mistakes. We're still making mistakes. We don't, every batch doesn't come out the way we want it to come out. Um, uh, but some batches come out better. <laughs> so, so uh, it, yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah, can you tell me a bit more what that process is like to make sure you are releasing a consistent product every time? Are you, how much testing are you doing? Yeah, it's at this point, our best way to make a consistent product is to take our time. We know that we're going to have to speed it up as we learn how to do it better, but it's not insane amount of time. Like we're not taking six months to make it, but, but that's the, if we take our time with it, Tommy, you know, Tommy, my partner, he's, he can test it every step of the way. Mostly he's just testing acidity. He's testing flavor and he's learned how the flavor progresses over time because he's done it so much now. It, so um, it's not very formulaic in terms of like just being able to turn it over to somebody else. We're not, we're not there yet. We have a formula, but they wouldn't be able to do it. So, and, and, and there, there, you know, there are a couple of other basic tests we're doing, you know, when it comes to packaging, we're always testing for oxygen level. Oxygen is massively impactful on the quality of your product in a package. So that we're testing for constantly. Um, the level of carbonation in the product, we're always testing sugar content. Um, um, and yeah, again, our, our best tool right now is to just take our time with it. And then when we do take our time with it, Tommy can make it reliably. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's, let's talk a little about financing. We had a question, do you recommend starting a fermentation business if your budget is small or should you work, wait until you get more funding? Well, <laughs> I mean, it's a horrible idea to start a business with no money. <laughs> but if you don't have any money, what else are you going to do? <laughs> like, just, I mean, you got to, you got to work with what you got and, and any, any pathway is possible. Really. I mean, you've heard, you, 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 everyone's heard stories. Some people start one way, other people start a different way. You, you know, you got to start with what you have and deal with that. So um, the good thing about starting with no money is you, you know, you have to learn uh, differently. If you have a lot of money at the beginning, you're going to lose a lot of money faster. I mean, you're going to. Um, nothing wrong with that either, but, um, you know, as long as you learn from it. But, yeah, again, I, I mean, you just got to start with what you have and go and go for it. Yeah. We had a lot of questions about social media. A lot of brands are relying on social media now since they can't meet face-to-face with their customers during the pandemic, do you have tips for how to grow your brand through social media? I mean, we're pretty bad at social media. <laughs> 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 I would love to be good at it, but I've never had the financial resources to, to like have a marketing department. Okay. So, so we've done the best we can with it. We're, we're a very grassroots relatable brand and we have fans that are like that. Um, but um, I mean, it, cl clearly right now, especially like you said, Amelia, it is almost the only way you have of getting in front of people at all. Yeah. Uh, and it's so, and it's, it's, it's a real bummer if you're making a product that's the whole point of the product is to be in their mouth <laughs> and to be in their body and you can't be there with them. Like, to making that happen. So, you know, how you do that on social media is, is still a mystery to all of us, <laughs> really. Find some way to get people samples is, you know, that's, that's mostly what we're trying to do. Yeah, well, that's interesting that you guys have built this brand without a huge marketing budget. <laughs> that's impressive. Yeah, for, I mean, 
for us, it's it really, it's because we have an incredible product. Yeah. And because even though we haven't had a very clear brand, it was starting to get more clear, but even though it hasn't been very clear, it's still been cool. It's been very real. And, and there's enough people out there that want that, that you can at least get started with that. You can't get to the finish line with just that, but you can yeah. get started. And, um, and that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's what's worked. How long did it take you to perfect your kombucha formula? Perfect? Yeah. <laughs> it's certainly it's not perfect. Um, I would say, right? Yeah, it's certainly, yeah. It, not for, it will never be perfected, Amelia. Not, not for me and Tommy, at least. Um, but, uh, but it, you know, it took, us, it took us two and a half years before we had something that we could put in a bottle. Yeah. I mean, I would go back to the previous question and say part of the, part of the key to um, selling stuff without a huge marketing budget is focus. And like uh, Dr. Hop started just in the Bay Area and um, Dr. Hop's won over some of the, um, some of the relationships we had with some of the retailers, we had real advocates within those organizations for Dr. Hops. And so like, don't do a national launch if you have no budget, you know, start in the Bay Area and then maybe California and then maybe Oregon or, you know, and so um, stage it um, and try to, try to find people who will be advocates and who will do your work for you for free um, or, or, you know, insiders in other organizations that I, that's just my, that's what I've seen. Um. Yeah, I, uh, for fermented foods especially, you peop, you know, people can actually care. I mean, people there are, there are people who want this, these types of foods and beverages more available, and and those are those are the people you need. I mean, they're 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 in retail stores. There there's a lot of consumers that want you know want real food. Um, there's some in distribution companies, maybe not as many, <laughs> but, but uh, there, you know, yeah, Alex, those are your allies for sure. And um, the more you can connect with those people, the better. One more question about um, maintaining a sort of, you know, the brand is all about healthy well-being, and yet it's a fair amount of alcohol. And so hence fair amount of calories and like, so how, how, how does Dr. Hops manage the, the, um, the healthy brand and not get, um, you know, in harmony with the alcohol and, and um, you know, it's not the lowest calorie uh, drink. There's real food in it. There are real herbs and, and real juices and not from concentrate and all that. But um, maybe say something about that because that's the yeah, I mean, that's, again, that's still probably our biggest challenge with the messaging of the brand and the marketing. Uh, um, you know, it's easy to, it's easy to, to do low calorie, it's, e it's easy to communicate. If it's got 80 calories, it's got 80 calories, you know, it's less than most other things. <laughs> but if it has twice as many calories, because it has 9% alcohol, and it has four grams of sugar, or five grams of sugar, like our stuff, how do you communicate what, what, why you would want to drink that? Um, and again, the best way we can is to have people try it. Well, try it, drink it, drink, drink, a, drink, a, drink it a bunch of times. See how you feel, like see how you feel, see how you like the, the taste of it. See how you like the experience of it. That, I mean, if people do that, we'll win. Um, cause it's, cause it's awesome. Um, but with the calorie content and the, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, that's, that's challenging. We're at this point. We're willing to gamble on um, enough people who care about transparency and authenticity that if we put the nutrition label on there and we list all the ingredients, even if it doesn't compare very well on a calorie level, there's enough else, there, there's enough else to it that people are going to try it. At least they'll try it. And we know if they try it, they're going to be like, holy crap. <laughs> This is some other stuff, right? This is this is something, and uh, and you know they they still might not bite a lot, but some people will. Okay, Joshua, my last question for you. We've had a few few people ask about e-commerce. Have you thought about shipping? Yeah, I mean, especially last in the last year, right? Uh, everyone did whatever they could to get into e-commerce. Uh, part partly extremely difficult for us 
pretty much the most difficult thing you could possibly try to ship to people is cold living product in glass. <laughs> Containing alcohol. <laughs> alcohol, right? Uh, uh, impossible, but you know, almost impossible. So we haven't, we haven't done a lot of it, just a little bit. Um, with the new cans, it'll be a lot easier for us. It basically cuts the weight in half, cuts the, the, the size of the package in half. Um, so, uh, and, and the alcohol industry is evolving rapidly towards that because of the pandemic. So um, I think for, I mean, I'm not, I'm not really successful at it yet but I know it's gonna be a significant part of our business. I don't think it'll ever be the, the majority of it, but, but yeah, you, everyone's gotta figure out, you know, figure out what they can do in that area for sure. Oh. <laughs> yeah. For us mostly, it's if you get it there fast enough, you don't have to worry too much about keeping it cold because it'll be okay if it gets there fast enough. Yes. <laughs> well, Joshua, Alex, thank you so much for being here with us today. I've this was wonderful hearing more insight behind Dr. Hops. It's been fascinating seeing how you guys are going to build on the momentum from 2020. We all heard how hard kombucha was the drink of 2020 and you are sure have a great plan to keep it, keep it up in 2021. So I wanted to thank everybody watching as well for attending today's webinar. We will be posting a recording uh, on TFA's website in the next 24 hours. We also have a number of great webinars coming up in the next few weeks, including Fermented Dairy and Health, Our Fermented Foods Probiotics, and the new definition of fermented food. Please go to fermentationassociation.org to check these out and register. And while you're there, subscribe to our YouTube, YouTube channel. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Amelia. You've been awesome. Thank you, Alex. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Bye. <laughs>